Okay, so today, uh, with the topic of today is uh, the combination, how to deal with the combination of theories. Okay, so we have seen uh, uh, the idea of SMT as a combination of a sub solver for a theory specific solver. But then from the very beginning of, uh, of this uh, chapter, we have seen that some very often, I would say most often, we have um, uh, the, the theory that we are, the formulas are built on combination of theories. Uh, mean, so, I uh, mean the fact that we have a specific solver having, being able to solve uh, problems for the single theory, and we want to see how we can deal with the formulas which involve uh, many of such theories, uh, how to combine those solvers. Okay, notice that very often the solvers are very different nature. So for instance, if you combine arrays with arithmetic, arrays is a purely automatic reasoning device. Uh, whereas uh, theory solver for uh, linear arithmetic is typically a numerical device. So something, some um, procedures which are very different in their nature, should we say. Okay, so uh, the idea is that in, in general, many problems uh, may be expressed as a SMT uh, only in combinations of theories. So we, so for instance, if we see at the very abstract way, a very simple circuit schema, where we have uh, inputs and outputs that suppose are integer or can be encoded as integers, we have a combination of uh, operations. So for instance, uh, we may have uh, these comparators saying if uh, this uh, V0 and V1 is uh, strictly greater than something, uh, then uh, this output is true, otherwise this is false. Same for uh, less equal, so the standard comparator. Okay, so, um, or we can, abst sometimes what we do, we abstract functionality. So if you have some complex functions, sometimes we encode them into uninterpreted functions. And the only constraints being the fact that uh, the same input generates the same output. Okay, so for instance, here we have that V3 is uh, H, function H applied to V0 and, uh, um, V4 is a function H applied to V1. And then of course you have some Boolean combinations. So you have some control uh, um, information which changes uh, the value or controls that uh, allows uh, triggers or non-triggers some values. So for instance, this is a multiplexer. So something which if reset, uh, if a reset uh, uh, is, uh, is true, then uh, here uh, e, v5 becomes v8, otherwise it's zero. This uh, is something that in electronics we call a multi multiplexer. Okay, and again, you can give an input uh, some function, like f uh, uh, v6 is f of v2, and v7 is, is f applied to v5. And then you have a comparator which says that uh, this is true if and only if uh, these two, uh, two values are identical, so on. So what is the, the example? So this is very simple example, and uh, but even with this very simple sample, you notice that we have the combination of two elements here, linear integer, arithmetic, and UF. And you can have many arrays, uh, uh, arithmetic, uh, strings, uh, bit vectors, uh, and so on and so forth. So you can have combination of theory. And of course, you don't have any solver which is able to, to solve together arithmetic with UF, arithmetic with um, arrays. You have separate solver, some solver which is able to solve arrays, some solver which is able to solve arithmetic, some solver which is able to, to solve UF, and you have to combine them. Okay, uh, the, well, so the original idea, uh, back to years ago, it was to use the so-called the Nesnopper approach, lesser open approach or Shostak approach to combine the theory solvers. So this uh, boiled down to before SMT and simply SMT adopted them. So the, the idea is based on the deduction and the exchange of equalities on shared variables. And uh, typically when, so you combine the theory solver and then you integrate the combination in a sub, with the sub solver. So you, you merge all the theory solver with, uh, 
all the theories of it all together into one single block, uh, theory solving block. And, and then you combine this big block with, uh, with the set solver. So this was the idea uh, the, before 2004. Then, uh, um, well, more recently, we are speaking of 2005, if I remember correctly. Um, the idea of delayed theory combination and uh, then more recently more based, a model-based combination. And the idea is that uh, the idea is based on Boolean search on equalities on shared variables and uh, the T solver integrated directly with the SAT tool. We'll speak, we'll describe uh, um, this in the next slide. Uh, so the idea was that in general, national open approach have some drawbacks and limitation when used within the SMT frameworks, which we are going to describe soon. Uh, before going through, I need some um, theoretical definitions. Um, well, we are speaking with theories with equality. So as we assume that every theory we are speaking about has equality as a, as a symbol, with the obvious standard meaning, okay? And also suppose that uh, uh, all the theory have disjoint signatures. So, uh, or they have different uh, uh, function and predicate symbols. So for instance, you have an arithmetic, okay? So you don't have such uh, uh, arithmetic and arrays. One, uh, so arithmetic and array, one has uh, read, uh, read and write as a function, the other has plus, minus, uh, and uh, uh, constants, uh, uh, small or equal, greater or equal, uh, blah, blah, okay? Um, the first important concept is the notion of a pure, uh, of a pure formula. So um, if a formula is, com is given by a combination of theories, T1 plus T2, a form is pure if and only if every atom in phi is pure for some theory E. So substantially, apart from variables, okay, or cont one atom contains all the proper uh, functions and predicates only of one theory, okay? So substantially an atom litera is pure for theory AI if, on if it contains only equalities, variable, and symbols from uh, only one theory, okay? So for instance, this atom here is not pure, okay? because this contains both symbols from arithmetic, minus, plus, okay? And symbols from UF, F and G, okay? So this atom is not pure. The key point is that we can only purify a formula by just introducing fresh variables, labeling, labeling terms. So notice that here is the main symbols, so the, we have some function and interpretive function symbols. And here we have an uh, arithmetical expression. So we we'll introduce a fresh variable labeling the arithmetical expressions. Let's say W and T, okay? And so we, we say, okay, W is X plus three Y and uh, T is to X minus Y, yes. And, and now we substitute the expression here. So W is, so this expression becomes F of W equals G of T. Okay, so notice that now this function, this form is pure because you have only, um, this is a UF, a pure UF atom. This is a pure arithmetical atom. This is a pure arithmetical atom, okay? Okay, uh, in all this discussion that we'll have for uh, combinational theories, uh, we'll implicitly assume that the formula has been purified, okay? Notice that this is not strictly necessary because uh, since uh, formulas are, we have a term bank, we have a label, we have a, a node in the term bank representing each term, it's enough that uh, well, we can do without a purification in practical implementation, but. Assuming that the formula is purified, that makes uh, the explanation much, much simpler. Okay, so this is what we are going to assume. Uh, we also have uh, uh, another definition, which is say interface variables, interface equalities. Okay, a variable 
of course, uh, in, uh, in, let's find a pure formula, of course. A variable V occurring in a pure formula is an interface variable or a shared variable if it occurs in both uh, U pure and Q pure atoms of phi. So if a, a, a variable occurs, for instance, you have uh, in this uh, chart, this section will use UF and uh, linear, real, linear uh, real arithmetic uh, as or linear integer arithmetic as uh, as example. Okay, so if a variable occurs both in uh, arithmetical atoms and the UF atoms, then we say to be an interface variable. Okay, and the quality is equalities between interface variables are called interface equalities. Okay. Um, well, in notationally, we use VI and v, v with the subscripts uh, uh, to denote variables. And uh, if uh, instead of VI equals VJ, we, short, we use the shortcut uh, EIJ for representing Y equals VJ. Okay. So, for instance, if you consider the previous formula that we have seen in, uh, so which is a mixture of uh, linear integer arithmetic and UF, we notice that, for instance, V0, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 are interface variables. Well, you see that V0, V1 occurs in arithmetical atoms, but also in UF atoms. Okay? Same V4, V5 occur in UF atoms, but also in an arithmetical atom. Okay, now it's an arithmetical atom because zero is an arithmetical there. Okay, uh, whereas instead, VH is not, VH is not uh, uh, an interface equality because it occurs uh, only in, uh, in, uh, uh, it, of course, and, uh, you can do, when you have a, a pure uh, equality between variables, so we have no proper symbols, you can assume uh, an atom, you, you may decide whether you consider this uh, a UF atom or, or, or um, a right atom. Okay, so V5 equal V8 can be both. Okay, you can consider both uh, a UF or a LRA atom. Okay, uh, well. Uh, okay, so so V6 and V7 are UF uh, variables only. Okay, okay, and um, okay. Note that V0 equal V1 is an interface equality. Yes, because V0 V1 are interface variables, but V0 equal V6 is not an interface uh, equality because V6 is not is an interface variable. Is it okay so far? Are the definition quite clear? I think they are reasonably intuitive, right? Once you have understood the notion of pure formula. Okay, uh, here uh, we uh, we say something about two kinds of theories. So we restrict our interest in uh, stably infinite theories. A stably infinite theory is every quantified free t satisfied form is satisfied. So a theory t is stably infinite if every quantified free uh, form which is satisfied in T is satisfied in an infinite model. So substantially, this means uh, that the theories by which uh, uh, you have uh, um, to say um, infinite theory means a, a theory with an infinite domain. Okay, so and the, here the intuition says uh, that uh, theory uh, which admit only a finite amount, a finite domains are not stably infinite. Okay, the reason for that I will anticipate is that uh, you should need um, an infinite amount of possible values to attribute to every variable. Okay, so this is the condition. So, for instance, equality and temporary function, difference logic, arithmetic are stably infinite theories. Bit vectors is not stably infinite theories. Why? Well, fixed with bit vector, I mean, because uh, uh, you cannot you do, you cannot attribute an infinite, a possibly infinite amount of values to a bit vector. Remember that a bit vector is a, an array of k bits or n bits. 
okay? So you have at, at most two to the n possible values, okay? So this is the notion. And another important, uh, another important uh, uh, fact about the complex theories is the following. A theory is another important definition. So in, in, our, um, in our discussion, we'll assume all function, all uh, theories that we are dealing are stably infinite, meaning we have uh, always uh, an infinite amount of values which we can give a different distinct values that we can give to every variable. Okay. Okay. So sustain. Okay. Another way to see a um, bit vector, uh, so the notion of uh, stably infinite, that uh, we can always assume that uh, uh, an arbitrary amount uh, of uh, variables may assume different values. Okay. So, for instance, if you have a big vector, if we have uh, uh, n bit uh, big vector variables, and we have uh, two two to the n plus one variables there should be at least two variables which have the same value. Do you agree? Because we have at most two to the n values. So if you have two to the n plus one variables, this means that uh, at least two variables can be equal. Okay, in stably infinite theories, this does not never happens. We can assume that any arbitrary set of, of uh, variables can have and can be all different. Okay, so that's the deep idea of uh, uh, stably infinite and the, the takeaway of the notion of stably infinite theory, okay? A more critical notion is that of convex theories, okay? A theory is convex if and only if for every collection of literals, L1, uh, Lk, and uh, let's say L, L prime, L, L second of literals in T, and such that uh, L1, L prime and L second are equality between variables. We have that uh, a set of literal entails a disjunction of literal if the same set of literal either entails the first literal or entails the second literal. So you cannot entail two the disjunction of two equalities without entailing one of the two equalities. Let me show you an example. Equality UF, DL, L ray are, are equality, right? So if uh, you say that you take every, uh, every, um, set of literals in uh, well, which also can set so the literal remember is also a truth assignment right uh, and uh, you have that uh, this entails uh, a, a disjunction of equalities like uh, x equal y or uh, z equal w then the same set of literal entails also x equal either entails uh, x equal y or entails uh, z equal w this is not the case of some other theories like linear integer. And here is an example. Considering, consider the fact that uh, uh, V0 equals one, 0, V1 equal 1, uh, V is greater or equal than V0 and is more or equal than V1. We are on the integers, okay? So the only two possible solutions to the only, so substantially V0, so this says that V is greater or equal than one, than zero and is more equal than one, okay? Then we can only say that V is either zero or, or is one, or, or V is one, okay? Because you are in the integers. But this does not mean 
that either be equal. That uh, this does not mean that this set of say entails v equals to zero, and it does not mean that this entails v zero is one. So you can have so substantially um, non-convex theories have uh, implemented some implicit case split of the theory. Okay, cause four fork. You see this? So some, uh, in order to check this, uh, you should check either the case that V is one or the case where V is two, is uh, zero. Okay. Are we there? Is it clear this definition? Well, typically, uh, well, this general rule of thumb is that typically uh, non-convex theories are much harder than uh, convex theories. Typically, non-convex theories are NP-complete. This is not a not you. So there exist some particular cases of of non-convex theories which are polynomial, but in general, typically this convexity opens the the fact that we are in. Uh, um, is an in MP is MP complete because uh, you you need uh, uh, splitting by case in order to reason on a single theory. Okay, so this is the all the theoretical stuff that you needed. Now now let's see. Sorry, what? Uh, yes, open the the classic technique. Uh, it, it, this was uh, found by uh, Nelson and Open uh, uh, in uh, the eighties. Uh, by the way, they won the Herbrand Award for uh, for their work. Okay, so so, so so the idea is how to combine uh, decision procedure for conjunctive uh, uh, conjunctions of literals uh, into one. And this was done by uh, and then also Shostak uh, made uh, a variation for the variant of that. And all is based on the notion of interface equalities. So. Think about that. Suppose you have a theory, you have two theories which do not share any predicate. They have no symbol in common. So not even equality. Okay. And you have uh, a set of literals which such that some literals are uh, belong to the one theory and some literals are pure for the other theory. And you have no, no common predicate, no common function. Okay. If this is the case, if it is where the case, uh, then this would be very simple, okay? Because simply you take the C1 pure set of literals, take the other, the, the two pure set of literals. If uh, the, the first set uh, is uh, satisfied by theory T1 and uh, the second set is satisfied in theory T2, then obviously. The, the the conjunction of the two will be satisfiable, right? Because they are they don't sh they have no symbol in common. So you have a model for the the the, the theory the subset in theory one. You have a model for the subset in theory two. They are completely independent. They have no symbol in common. So they simply share value. So you can give an interpretation. Even they share variable, right? Because you can uh, always uh, associate. Since the variables are unrelated, so you give one value, the value you give in one theory is completely unrelated to the value you give in the other theory. Okay? So, for instance, in general, if uh, a set of literals does not contain any interface, uh, any quality, okay, between any quality, this is still the case. So, you can just solve separately and the result is satisfiable if you only if both are satisfied. Unfortunately, all the theories of interest share one predicate, one essential predicate. You cannot typically you cannot do without, which is equality. Okay. And here is a problem because uh, the problem arises on the fact that you have some variables in common. Okay. If you have shared variables, so you may have. Uh, equalities between variables okay and so it may be the case if you separate the two 
um, the two um, sub the two sets of uh, uh, literals, the UF one and the arithmetic one on the side. It may be the case that the UF solver finds a truth assignment, uh, um, an evaluation for a model for uh, the UF. The other, uh, the arithmetic uh, funds one for the uh, for those uh, uh, in uh, linear arithmetic but unfortunately it may be the case that the first model sets uh, uh, two, uh, two shared variables as equal to the same value and the linear arithmetic sets the value to different values and this is not possible right because if the only constraint that you have is that if two variables have the same value on the theory, they must have the same value also in the other theory. Okay, this is an if and a leap. So substantially, the models that the theory solver find in the, for the separate solver find for their uh, specific atoms must agree on the quality of the of the shared variables. Do you agree, guys? Okay. So here, the interface equalities have a, a crucial role here. So the idea was that the idea by Nelson Oppel was to do such that every theory solver, when uh, it finds a satisfiable, deduces, entails all the possible equalities which come as a as a consequence of, of that uh, um, of the set of literals and passes the quality to the other one okay so i solve my problem okay i solve something in a linear integer arithmetic okay i found this satisfiable but i know i noticed that in order to be satisfiable uh variable one and variable two must be equal so i pass this information so in order to create a common model also the other variable also the other solver must agree on this concept on this equality so this works as follows each theory solvers according to the nelson open uh, technique does the following checks the satisfiability so okay we partition uh, first of all we partition the uh, every the set of literals into two parts the theory one pure atoms and the theory two pure atoms, okay? If there are interface far, uh, if there are equalities uh, uh, among atoms, you decide which size uh, you, you put them, okay? Typically in the, in the easiest, so, okay? Okay, each solver in turn does the following. Check the satisfiability in this, the TI satisfiability of its own part, specific part. And here is the critical point, deduces all the interface equalities which derive from UI. Notice, that, and this is one problem we have, that some, if the TI is not convex, okay, then it must be able to deduce disjunctions of interface equalities. But let's suppose this is convex for a while, okay? So, I say, I'm uh, the UF solver and tell you, look, and the UF is convex, okay? I say, okay, look, uh, this set of literal you gave me is satisfiable, but then you must deduce, but this is as a consequence that variable X must be equal to variable Y as a consequence of the set solver. You have to pass this information to the LRL solver because we want the LRL solver to find models only such that x, the value of x is equal to the value of y. But then as a consequence, so you add a new, this new equality to the other solver. So you pass this information to the other solver, which solves that. Then the other solvers deduces other equalities, which are passed back to the, the theory of one and so on and so forth. Until either one, two things happen. One T-solver detects an inconsistency from which you can conclude that the two sets are mutually inconsistent or no more deduction are possible from which we can conclude that 
that the formula is satisfiable because uh, they agree on all, uh, on all possible. So they are both satisfiable, you agree on possible interface equalities. Notice that when you have disjunction non-convex theories, things get much worse because then you pass to the other solve a disjunction. So you have to, to check separately the case with one equality and, and with the other one. I will show you an example. So architecture-wise, Nelson Open can be seen as a, a, a two combination of two, a one big T solver, which works with two, two or more. This is the two case, but of course this is uh, associative, so you can uh, have an arbitrary amount. So a T solver is able to check whether the satisfiability of the set and to deduce some interface equality, which pass to the other solver. This this is added in input. Uh, this is solved, so it uses other uh, equalities or disjunction of equality and so on and so forth. Okay, until either this is found inconsistent or no more equality can be deduced. Let me show you an example. Okay, suppose well consider uh, the example the the example before and assume that uh, the variables are, uh, for instance, reals. Okay, so the theory is convex. Okay. Okay. Suppose we have two two possible situations. Okay. Notice that this is not a conjunction literal, but this uh, have an implication depending on reset, the value, Boolean value reset. The, there is a case with the reset uh, true and the case with the reset false. Okay. If reset true, V five is zero. Otherwise, uh, V five is equal to V eight. Okay, this was a very simple pseudo circuit that I, we have seen at the beginning of this class. Okay, consider the case of uh, reset five. If reset five is true, then uh, we have V five equals zero. Okay, and uh, uh, and V five equal V eight is is not part of the truth assignment. Okay, so all these atoms are part of the truth assignment except V five equals V zero. Okay, which is, if the set is true, then this clause is wiped. Okay, now this truth assignment is passed to, uh, you have a Boolean branch and this passed to the theory solver. The theory solver splits the theory atom in between UF atoms and the LRI atom in particular. We have this set of UF atoms, which are substantially the definition of the function of the output of the functions, so V3 equals H of V0 and blah, blah. And also we have V6 equal V7. We assume, for instance, that we have a set of V6 equal V7 has to be UF, okay? This is an arbitrary, you can decide each way, okay? So suppose you consider this UF. And then you have linear, in, linear real arithmetic, okay? Okay. Um, now, from the linear, so which are V0 smaller equal than V1, V0 smaller equal than uh, V1, V2 is V3 minus V4, and V5 equal 0. Okay? Now, from these two atoms, the theory solver is able to deduce that V0 is V1 because he knows the semantic of V0, V1. Okay? So every candidate model uh, of uh, this uh, uh, set of global set of literal must necessarily must give the same value to zero one due to this couple of constraints here. Do you agree? Obvious, right? Okay. So th this says the uh, the LRA solver who knows the notion of what the, the meaning of these two symbols tells the other theory solver, look, notice that no matter what, V0 must be equal to V1. So every possible candidate, every possible models, general model, combined model, must give the same value to V0 V1. Okay? So it passes the, the narrow equality to V0 V1 to the to the F solver, which adds to the set of, uh, uh, of atoms. Okay? But now, knowing V0 equals V1, notice that variables from V0 to V5 are interface variables, okay? 
But knowing that V0 V1, the UF solver who knows that H and uh, uh, H is a, a function can deduce that V3 equals V4 by congruence, okay? So he deduces that V3 V4 because due to congruence, every model, candidate model, joint model of the, these set of liters must assign the same value to V3 and V4. So it informs the other guy here, passing back this equality to V3 over 4. So V3 must be equal to V4. And this is passed again to the set uh, of arithmetic, arithmetic uh, uh, solver. But the arithmetic solver now looks at this atom here and say, ho ho, look, if V3 is equal to V4, then V2 must be equal to zero. But if it, V2 is equal to zero, then V5 and V2, and V2 are the same value, okay? So it can deduce that V2 equals V5, okay? And it passes back this information to the, to the UF solver. The UF solver says, oh, now I know that V2 must be, must be equal to V5, but then, then I have a problem. Because if V2 is equal to V5, then V6 must be equal to V7. But here, it is a conflict. So I found faults. I found an inconsistency. So thanks to the information that uh, the two solvers have exchanged, have deduced an exchange, each in his own uh, domain of expertise, then they have been able to, to understand that globally, Globally, this set of, um, of constraints is, is inconsistent, okay? So the, the solver backtracks and finds another, another set of literals. Well, another set of literals will, with the reset equal false. With the set equal false, V5 is no more set to zero, but V5 is set to V8. So the solver redoes exactly the same sequence of actions, but now, from V3 to equal V4, he's no more able to do to deduce anything more because he doesn't have V5 equals zero anymore. Okay, so he stops here. He has nothing more to he's nothing more to deduce. Okay, so he, he can conclude that the form is satisfied. But I have no more equalities that he can so neither has more equality that he can deduce. Okay. So, okay, fine. Now I, we have deduced all the possible constraint, equality constraints between variables, okay? We have found a set which is consistent in UF and is consistent in LRA, okay? And we can conclude that it's satisfiable. So why can we conclude that it's satisfiable? Because uh, since we have no more equality to infer, we can conclude that all the possible, uh, we can conclude that all the possible, the other interface equalities are false. Why can we do that? Because we are establishing uh, infinite. If we are establishing infinite, we can assume uh, that an arbitrary amount of variables is all. Uh, different, assume different value. So the reason why we can conclude that V5 equal V6 is that both LRA and UF is stably infinite, which means that we can uh, arbitrarily set an arbitrary money amount of different values to the, to the equality which are not set. So we can assume that the other cell, that uh, V0, uh, V3, and uh, V5 are all different. So no, we can assume that no more equality constraint can be fulfilled. Okay? So this is why that's not the word. What happens when we have a convex theory? We have non-convex theory, sorry, sorry. If we have non-convex theory, 
Ah, okay, sorry, uh, one, one more thing to say. Now we also have a problem. One further problem that we have is what is the, okay, we have found, uh, for instance, in this branch here, we have found an inconsistency, okay? Remember, a theory solver should get some, uh, um, should get some uh, um, a conflict set of that. Well, finding a conflict set for that is quite complicated, right? Because, uh, uh, okay, so when you find this, uh, you, have a you have a deduction here, you perform a deduction, meaning that from V6 equal, um, okay, you can backward the reason on, um, so the, the last deduction says that V6 equal, uh, if uh, V6, uh, since V6 is equal to F2, and V7 is equal to F to V5, and V6 equal V7, and you have a previously deduced that V2 equal V5, then you can conclude false. So this means that this is a conflict set. But unfortunately, V2 and V5 is not, is not a, an atom occurring in the formula. So this is not a conflict set. It's something that is a new atom that you have deduced, okay? So this is not a conflict set. So what you have to do is to combine then with the previous deduction performed by the arithmetic solver, which says, okay, look, since V2 equals V3 minus four and V5 equals zero, and, and you have given, told me that V5 equals V6, then V2 equals V5. You can combine these two guys here, Okay, you, you can see this as a disjunction, okay? These are two disjunctions, you, you resolve them. And you have substantially the combination of all those atoms plus minus these two, right? This is a standard conflict analysis, right? So to say, the equivalent of standard conflict analysis. Bo, 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 bo. You do all these steps together, so every time you have one atom which is not part of the original formula, okay? So at the end of the day, you have a huge, huge truth assignment, huge uh, conflict, okay? So all the, the same of all those atoms here combined that cause the false, giving a combination of arithmetic order. So this is very inconvenient because it gives you quite a big amount of, of atoms. We see how we can do better in a few slides from now. Uh, okay, what happens instead when we have a non-convex theories? When you have a non-convex theory, for, for instance, from linear integer arithmetic, then things get more complicated because you may need some internal split to the solver. So what happens here? Uh, okay, so suppose you have this set of constraints, okay, and then you have a split uh, into uh, a UF part plus a, a, a new LREA uh, part. Okay, from this uh, uh, set, uh, you can deduce that V1, V0, okay, that V1 can be either zero or one. We are in the integers now, right? Which means that v, either V1 equals V3 or v1 equal v4 because either equals zero or equal one okay so notice this says v1 is either zero one we are on the integers okay since v3 and v4 are equal we can deduce that either v1 equals v3 or v1 equals v4 okay but unfortunately, this is not uh, this is not convex, okay? But this is the, the very same example that we have seen before, right? So we have to deduce that either v1 equals v3 or v1 equals v4. But we cannot deduce that v1 equals v3, and we cannot deduce that v1 equals v4, okay? Because we have this junction. So when you deduce this junction of atom, this should be trigger. The idea is that your our theory is well, the theory is non convex and very likely is incomplete to solve. Okay. Okay, so you pass this information to the other solver. So you pass this disjunction. Well, but the theory solver does not 
is not able to deal with this junction. He has no Boolean component of reason on the side. So he has no chance that separate the two cases. One equals V3 and the, and the case one equals V4. So he tries first V1 equals V3. Okay, but if one, the case, if V1 equals V3 here, okay, then you can deduce that V5 equals V6. Okay. In this case, well, he passes back this information. But if V5 equals V6, uh, where is it? Okay. Then uh, uh, V5 is V4 minus 1, which means that V5 is 0. Okay. Um, okay. Whereas, uh, v2 is v6 uh, plus 1 and if you know that v5 equals 6 this means that v2 is 1 okay so in this uh, if v5 equal v6 uh, this means that either v2 is 0 or that is equal to v0 or it's equal to v um, to v4 one okay you see that this is just a little bit so v2 uh so if v2 so v6 uh, uh, is v5 which is zero so this says uh, v2 is greater or equal than zero and this says v2 is great, smaller or equal than uh, 1, which means that v2 and v5, uh, v2 can I be, is either 0 or 1. But since v3 is 0 and v4 is 1, this, this allows us to entail the, again this disjunction, okay? Which we pass. And again, we, this forces a case split here. So if we set that v2 equals v3, but v2 equals v3 uh, uh, here. Uh, this means that uh, v1, uh, v2 is also equal to v1, okay? Because of, so both v3 equals v, um, both. So from these two equalities, we can deduce that v, v1 equals v2, which is in conflict with this constraint here. Okay, so we can conclude false. Same if we deduce that v2 equals v4, again v2 uh, here, uh, v2 equals v4. Uh, why is this inconsistent? Um, uh, uh, the second constraint of uh, UF. Uh, Not that uh, v2 equals v4. Ah, okay, yes, obviously, we we fail on this, okay? So we can conclude that this branch is false. Then we have to look at this other branch here. But if we set instead of the one equals V4, well, we have no constraint here. So we can conclude this is satisfiable. But note is that in doing all these complicated things, we have done lots of branches, okay? So we have done some case split, something which is the theory solver is not good in doing that. So you must explicitly split case by case, which is very inconvenient. Okay. Okay. So overall, what in order to solve this, we have performed three deductions of uh, interface equalities, and we have analyzed three branches. Okay. So let's. Uh, Okay, so overall, the idea is uh, uh, to, to combine two or more three solvers into a new one uh, based on the deduction and the exchange of the qualities between shared term variables, okay? So what are the, the problems with that? So they were not conceived for SMT. They were considered for single decision procedures, for combining single decision procedures for conjunctions of literals. And with the SMT, they are not good for why? They're not very good, why? 
Because the first of all, the main problem is that they require deduction capabilities from theory solver, which is very hard to obtain sometimes. Notice that one very important assumption upon which the theory solver is based, this scheme is based, is that if an equality can be deduced, is uh, can be deduced, the theory solver must be able to deduce it. Okay, this is very strong because a strong assumption. Okay. Because, well, you really require strong deduction capabilities for your theory solvers, which may be, for instance, for integer arithmetic, it's not so obvious to have it. Okay? Well, when you have non-convex theories, case splits are forced by the deduction of the genre. So you, you have to handle case splits inside the, the, the theory solver, which, which are typically not good at doing that. And what happens is that uh, uh, this generates typically very long uh, lemmas without interface equalities. And this seems substantially means that you cannot share the lemmas between one deduction to a similar deduction in the next branch. So substantially have not much advantage of a big jumping and learning in, uh, in uh, AIJ reasoning. So what's the problem with that solver? That it was not conceived for SMT. Okay, it was conceived simply as a combination of theories, uh, of, uh, of a decision procedure for the conjunctive fragment of theories. Okay, so this came to another technique. Um, would you like to have a five minutes, uh, 10 minutes interval? Yes, okay. Okay, so see you in uh, 10 minutes, okay, at uh, uh, 18, okay? Uh, sorry, I, I have a question, uh, Rico, here. Okay, Professor. Okay, so instead, okay, so instead we, uh, oh, so I find, uh, we have proposed a, a different technique, which is called uh, a delayed theory combination. And then later it was further improved uh, by Demur and the colleagues uh, into a model-based uh, uh, theory combination. And the idea was to in involve the SAT solver in, uh, uh, in the theory combination. So, so far it was simply a combination of theory solvers. And then when they were combined, interacting with the solver. The idea is, was instead to combine the SAT solver with the theory solver separately and involve the SAT solver uh, in, in the combination. In particular, this was uh, two effects to uh, uh, share some reasoning effort to delegate to the SAT solver some reasoning effort which was which in SNOP was delegated to the theory solver. In particular, the deduction of interface equalities and the handling of the case split in case of a non of a, a non convex theories. So the idea is to inform the SAT solver a priori of the existence of the interface equalities. Okay. Uh, substantially. Uh, the idea is not in such a way you uh, um, so that the SAT solver can reason on interface equalities, also not only on atoms which are original part of the form. So assume implicitly that the interface equalities are part of the formula. If you wish, uh, you could think uh, one way of thinking that is assuming that you have uh, you add to the formula. Uh, a valid formula on the, all the possible interface equalities that you have. But this is, of course, something you don't do, of course, but this is just to give you the intuition. So you can assume that for every, for instance, that in, for every interface equality, you have added uh, equal EIJ or not EIJ, which is a valid clause, right? So substantially, the, the SAT solver is informed a priori that you can reason also on interface equalities on the inputs. So this allows us to do some very nice things like avoiding uh, um, possibly expensive capability, deduction capabilities from the theory solvers and uh, let uh, the 
SAT solver handle the case split induced by the um, the uh, non, -conve non convexity of the theory. And what is more important, to generate theory lemmas with involved interface equalities, which allows for back jumping and learning. Let's see how is the idea. So you have, uh, so if you, okay, if you compare this schema here, okay, so this is, you have one global theory solver which have to interact has to interact with the, with the sub solver. Here, instead, the architecture is different. So we have the sub solver, which is informed of the existence of the interface equalities a priori. Okay, and so uh, so he can is free to assign atoms on interface equalities, just as a strategy. It reasons on interface equalities only when. Uh, when he has assigned all the others equality. And as a general strategies, he always try to assign a negative value, so false to all interface equalities uh, until he's forced to do something different, okay? So suppose in general, the truth the sub solver generates a truth assignment, okay? Well, the truth assignment can have three possible components Okay, one specific for theory one, made of one pure atoms, one made of two pure atoms, specific for theory two, and the truth assignment on the interface equalities. So the sub solver passes the truth assignment for, to every theory, the combination of the theory specific atom plus the truth assignment to the interface equalities. He passes them to both. Notice that in this way, the theory solvers must agree also interface equalities because they are past a given truth assignment. So all possible model, which the T1 solver funds and the two solver funds agree by construction on the equality between interface variables because the sub solver has passed them to them. Okay, so this is the global idea. So the Boolean solver assigns values not only to the atoms in, in atoms of five, but also to interface equalities. And the result we have a truth assignment which is combination of a one theory one pure part, a theory two pure part and a set of uh, the truth assignment to the interface equalities, okay? This, of course, the, and the, each theory solvers interact only with the one bool, with the Boolean solver, so there is no direct interaction between the theory solvers, and it receives a combination of this specific atom plus the truth assignment to all the interface equalities, okay? And it checks the satisfiability until either some mu is found to be uh, 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 to be consistent on both theories and by construction they agree on interface equalities so this is this problem is satisfiable or no more truth assignments are valid okay so let's see how can we improve this so well the, substantially, the benefit is that you you use DPLL, so CDCL-based uh, techniques, so you benefit all state-of-the-art sub-techniques. Well, you invoke the three solves before every Boolean decisions, so you handle total assignments only when you strict. Uh, this is strictly necessary. The key uh, one essential feature that you postpone as long as possible branching on EIJ. So you first decide. Uh, atoms on the original formula and you decide the atoms on the uh, EAJ atoms only afterwards. Uh, and this is uh, as a strategy that we adopted in the theory combination was that uh, we had, uh, we assigned only false values first and we'll show why this in two steps. 
the good news is that you can learn uh, if since the solve the sub solver is informed of the existence of interface equalities you can learn clauses on the interface involving interface equalities so these are clauses that you can reuse from branch to branch so as if you re you don't need to redo deductions that you have done by civil theory solver from one branch to the other as it was with the national opera i will show you examples So you, when as when one theory solver deduces one literal, so or does something which is equivalent to deducing one literal, then you learn this as you can learn this as a clause because now the such solver is informed of the existence of the AHN. So you can learn this clause. Okay, you can learn this clause even though L is an interface equality, because the sub solver is informed of the existence of the interface equalities. So this deduction is learned forever in the formula. So the next time you have in a branch, you have a mu prime, then the, this, uh, the deduction of the, the interface equality is done directly by unit propagation by the sub solver. So that's, it. so the first deduction, the first time this deduction performed, it's performed in some way by the theory solver. But the second time, it's performed directly by the, by the sub solver, by unit propagation of the clause. So you don't repeat the same deduction for different branches. So the same deduction is done only once in different branches. That's one of the key points. Okay, let's make some example. Okay, let's start from the case of non-convex theory. Okay, so it was the previous example, right? You have done uh, this truth assignment. So you have done some search and you have deduced this set of literals. Okay, again, you separate um, uh, LIA atoms to, from a UF atoms. Okay, and then suppose your theory solver have no deduction capabilities. Okay, so without theory propagation. So your theory solver suppose have no deduction capabilities. So they cannot deduce uh, interface equalities. Now you go reasoning. Okay, you start branching on interface equalities. Interface equalities, you assign all the value negative as a strategy. So when you have you have assigned one to three, one equals to three to false and one to four to false, well then. You have uh, you have a conflict. The the linear integer arithmetic solver tells you that you have a conflict. This is incompatible, right? Why? Because this says that v four equals v four. Sorry, uh, uh, because uh, uh, yeah, okay. Because uh, this means substantially that v one cannot be one, and v one cannot be zero okay but then this is incompatible with this you agree if you say that one cannot be equal to zero and one cannot be equal to one so altogether the combination of this 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 and these two literals is unsatisfiable in linear integer arithmetic so this backtrack and you learn the close uh, I, I represented the clauses as implications, but you know that uh, this is the same as saying that, uh, well, okay, so this is a subset of uh, atom, which is exactly this atom, this atom, this atom, and this atom, okay? So writing this an implication just says that uh, the disjunction of those literal here or this part Okay, well, remember that an implication can always be seen as, as a disjunction, okay? I prefer writing them as an implication because uh, this will uh, help us uh, to see their, the comparison uh, with Nesson Opera, okay? So you learn this clause here, okay? You learn this clause in this branch, and then you backjump, 
you make JavaSynth with this, you may jump to the highest point where you would have done something different if only you had not this clause. And this is actually this one, because once you have this assigned and this assigned to false, then you would have deduced, so, and sorry, and this assigned to false, then you would have deduced one equals to three. So you can deduce one equals to three. Notice that this is equivalent to perform an implication that new li prime and uh, one equals, uh, not one equals four implies one equals three. Okay. Okay, think, uh, remember that implication can also be written as clauses, okay? I prefer writing this an implication because this is actually the meaning here, okay? Okay, so when you're here, then you go ahead and you, you do some other decisions on interface variable until you set bu5 equal bu6 to false, okay? But with bu5, and bu6, uh, five bu6 for uh, uh, being different, this means that bu3 and bu1 must be different by congruence, okay? Which uh, uh, bu1 and bu3, which is in conflict with this statement here, okay? So you can deduce, okay, that. Uh, some constraints like uh, these two guys here, plus the fact that one equals bu3, you, and not bu5 equal bu6 is, is false. So you write this in this form, right? That you prime uf, so we, uh, where you prime uf is given by these two, is a subset of the truth assignment, and uh, this is given by these two guys here, right? Uh, and one equals bu3, And bu5 equal bu6 is false. So, oh, so and sorry, or uh, and, and not bu5 equal bu6 is false, which means implies bu5 equal bu6. Okay. So you learn this clause, but if you learn this clause, you can back jump and assign bu5 equal bu6 here. So again, jump to the all this place where you would have done something different. So this means imply bu5 equal bu6. And then again, you go ahead until you assign not bu2 equals bu4 and not bu2 equal bu3, okay? Which means that bu2 uh, uh, cannot be, uh, um, cannot, this says bu2 cannot be uh, one. This says bu2 cannot be zero, but this is in conflict with what we have just deduced, okay. Remember, v2 and v2 must be so since uh, we have learned that v5 equal v6, uh, this and that v5 uh, is zero. This means that uh, uh, v5 uh, uh, is uh, uh, and v6 are zero, okay. So this means that v2 can only be zero or one. But since this says that v2 cannot be zero cannot be one and bu2 cannot be zero, then you can infer uh, the clause that blah, blah, blah. So this set of, say, of atoms here and bu1 equals bu3 and bu2 equals bu3 implies zero. So you learn this clause, which causes you to jump and uh, on the latest assigned variables, which is bu2 equals bu3 and you assign it to uh, true. But then, after you have uh, entailed that, you also jump. This is in conflict. So once, once you assign the v2 equals v3 here, v2 equal v3 uh, here, this says that also uh, on uf, uh, so the combination of v2 equals v3 here, and uh, uh, v, um, v2 equal, uh, well, v2 equals v3 here, uh, let me check, v2 equals v3, and v1 equals v3, this also says that v1 equals, 
v, um, uh, v1 equals v2, okay, which is inconsistent here. Notice the combination of this with this says that v2 equals v1, okay, which is incompatible with this the congruence. So you jump here and uh, you undo this uh, uh, statement, which is v2 equals v1. Okay, so it undoes this one. Uh, so you learn this this clause here, which forces you to impose that v2 equals v4. But if you impose that v2 equals v4, so that is v2 equals one, okay? Then this causes an inconsistency at uh, the at uh, uh, the uh, um, LIA level. Uh, why is that? Because uh, um, you have seen that v6 is zero. Um, uh, sorry, uh, two equals four. Uh, why is this inconsistent? Because of the second clause in uh, EUF, I guess. Ah, okay, it's still EUF. So yes, I was. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, this is still a UF. Uh, I, I was looking. Really, yes, of course, but because v three is incompatible with this. Yeah, you're right. I was looking at the wrong, uh, the wrong part. Yes. Okay. Again, you have another interface equality. You have another conflict at the level. So at the end of the day, you jump to v1 equals v4, okay, due to, since you have learned this, but with v1 equal uh, v4, okay, then you, you can stop and conclude this is sad. Okay, so what have you done here? You have performed six branches. So. Remember that Nelson Alpe used the three deductions and uh, three branches. Now you have ch change one deduction for one branch more, because notice that this uh, um, this one, this branch here, okay, is corresponds to a deduction in uh, a linear integer arithmetic. This one, so this branch here, where is it? This one could correspond to deduce the disjunction of, of these two equalities in linear integer arithmetic. This uh, branch uh, here corresponds to a deduction in UF. And this branch uh, here, where is it? Two equals two, three. Uh, and this branch here, corresponds to a deduction in UF. The rest are just the branches in, in the set solving. So the first thing that we have learned that we have, uh, we have traded deductions in the, within the UF, so the, the, SM, the theory solver with the search in the Boolean part. But it's much more than in this case, okay? The first thing that we, if we had, Deduction, okay, so these three steps mimics exactly the deduction capability that we have seen in the theory solver. So we don't need any more deduction capabilities in the theory solvers. This is the first remark, okay? So notice that these three steps equivalent to deductions. So for instance, this, is, so this one is like a deduction in UF, okay? Uh, so, so but if we have instead deduction capabilities, then we use the theory propagation to mimic the behavior of Nelson Open. So in this case, if our tool is able to deduce T1 to T4, then okay, we have we add this clause and we branch on uh, one case, for instance, not v1 equal v2 by which we unipropagate v1 equal v3, by which uh, if uh, he has deduction probabilities immediately 
that uses V5 equals V6, then we can deduce the disjunction. So we can find, again, we deduce this, and we, we branch uh, with unipropagated V2 equals V3 here. This causes an inconsistency, as before. So by UF, uh, we deduce V2 equals V4. Notice that these are exactly the same clause as before, so I don't repeat myself. So you jump, and then you get V1 equals V3. So these slides show you that if your three solver have the same deduction capabilities, then Nelson open, then you, you substantiate the technique can mimic Nelson open. So cannot be worse than Nelson open. So with the same hypothesis than Nelson open, we, uh, he does at least the same step than Nelson open, but typically does more, does much better. Why? Because in the meantime, in both cases, in the meantime, we have learned plenty of clauses involved with, with uh, uh, interface equalities. What does this mean? That every time in a different branch, we need the same deduction from the theory solver. We don't redo that because we, are, we already have the clause which mimics the deduction. So this is done by the sub solver by unit propagation. So you don't repeat the same deduction the, the, of the theory solver from one call to the other, from one branch to the other. Because, why? Because the, the um, theory solver does this deduction for you on the clause that you have learned. Okay? Let's see another example uh, with convex, so the, we, have, we see another example with, of this factor uh, with the case, uh, with our original case. So we have a convex theory, so LRA, linear real arithmetic, so it's convex. And remember that we added these two branches, right? One with V5 equal V0 and the other with the V5 equal V8, okay? So let's do the, follow, the first one. Again, you do the search with uh, all the two tratum. Then suppose you set the reset to five, so which means that V5 equals V0, okay? Then you deduce interface equality. So suppose we don't have any theory propagation. Okay, so you deduce, 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 deduce. So you assign a force to all atoms until you do the right choice and assign not V0 equal V1. So V1 cannot be the same as uh, uh, V0, uh, okay? But that's obviously in contrast with this. Do you see? You have no deduction capability, so V0 equals V1. So if I assign these two folds, this violates these two constraints, okay? From this, we can jump up to here. Actually, we jump higher, but suppose that we uh, we have uh, we can do this later, and we can add the v zero equal one. Actually, we would jump higher. We jump as to the place where we have assigned this. But let for simplicity, let's assume that we we uh, jump here. Okay. So we learn that these two guys here entail V0 equal V1. We learn this clause, which forces us to entail V0 equals V1. And then we go ahead searching and searching until we negate V3 equals V4. But negating V3 equal V4, okay, since V0 equals V1, then V4 would be the same as V3. But if we negated this, okay, this suggests uh, this is obviously inconsistent. Okay, which says that mu prime, so the which is the combination of these two guys here. Okay, plus v zero equals v one. We are here. Is incompatible with the v three equal v four force. So in test v three equal v four. So we learn this clause here. So we back jump and assign a unipropagate v3 equals v4. 
actually, this is simplification it will jump higher here, right? Because uh, those atoms here, here were assigned uh, somewhere here. Okay, but let's suppose this is this is the case. Okay, so actually this branch would be lower here, but let's suppose for simplicity this is not the case. Okay, so we have a sine of three equal to four, and then we again blah 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 until we assign V2 equals V5 to false. But V2 equals V5 to false is inconsistent with L array. Okay, uh, why this is the case? Because V2 equals V5, uh, uh, well, we have V5 equals zero. Okay, since V3 equals V4, also V2 must be equal to V5. Okay, so this is incompatible with this. Okay, so the, the array tells us that a set of constraints here, in particular, this atom here, okay, plus five equals zero, and uh, um, mm, yes, uh, makes uh, uh, and uh, vo, uh, uh, makes uh, uh, v two equal v five impossible. So again, we make jump and assign v two equal v five. Learning this clause here, importantly, learning every time we do something, we learn the corresponding clause. Now, so this forces v two equals v five. Okay, with V2 be equal V5 here, uh, where is it? V2 equal V5, okay. Uh, uh, we learn that V6 equal V7. But V6 equal V7 is incompatible with this. So the combination of this set, these three atoms here, with V2 equals V5 causes an inconsistency. Okay, so this subset, so which is these three guys here, plus V2 equals V5 is in implies that V6 equals V7. So this is, a, this, you will learn this clause. Again, this is a clause, uh, I write this as an implication because the meaning is an implication, but this is, this is solving implies in, uh, less as a clause. What happens now when we jump here? Okay, when we jump here, well, we have we already have all those clauses here, so we don't re need redoing this all this reasoning because we have already the clauses here, right? So this will conclude that this is sat by just we, there's no need to redo this. So we he learn these uh, values and we'll uh, we'll uh, uh, tell that this is sat without redoing all these deductions because you already had the deduction. Closes tell you already. The, the, the deduction. So as soon as all the letters by one is assigned, then the deduction is performed automatically by the sub solver by unit propagation. Okay. Let's see this in the next slide, which is what happens if we had the same problem with deduction capabilities. So this, so the theory solver had deduction capabilities. Okay. As soon as you apply reset from and you assign the v5, you, this is that you unipropagate v2 equals v0, then the LRI atom deduces v0 equals v1, as we have seen before, right? Because, well, well, you actually would deduce it earlier than that, but okay, from this you deduce, it deduces v0 equals v1, okay? But with V0 equals V1, the UF solver deduces that V3 equals V4. Okay. 
So V3 equal V4 is a unit propagator. But if V5 equal V4, uh, V3 equal V4 here, then they the use the V2 equals V5 because both are zero. Okay, so they use V2 equals V5. But deducing V2 equal V5, he, this guy will deduce that v, from this that V6 equals V7, which is in conflict with this. So we'll deduce unsat. So in doing that, he will deduce all those clauses here. But now, with those, those clauses deduced, exactly as in this case here, you just you need propagate all those values as soon as you set reset to five you need propagate all those clauses here this would happen the same here so here in both cases you will is not reported here but you deduce immediately v0 equals v1 and v3 equals v4 okay and then you conclude something what is the important part that you don't redo the search the, the, you don't redo this deduction because you have already reported this deduction here. You already have the theory lemmas represented as deduction. You don't redo them. You just unipropagate. So just to, to compare this and open, uh, let's go back to the the, key, the example that we had here. Okay, here. The same problem, the Nelson op had to redo all those deductions, even though they are very identical, because there's no way of remembering them from one to the other. And the clauses are not of help. But since we are learned here instead, we are learning clauses. Sorry, where is it? We are learning clauses which. Uh, represent the deduction that you have performed then it's the sat solver so the first time the deduction is performed by the sat solver by the theory solver the second time is done directly by unit propagation of the sat solver on the learner clauses this is a huge advantage okay so actually uh, what uh, uh, what actually current sub -sol uh, SMT solver do use, uh, uh, including maths, uh, use an evaluate uh, an improvement of this technique, which is called uh, model based uh, uh, model based uh, uh, theory combination. So uh, it does everything lazily, but when a model is found, you check against all the possible interface equality. So you you keep track of the model that the, the theory solver found, and uh, substantially. Uh, you find that if the theory solver agree on the implied equalities, then you return SAT. And otherwise, uh, you branch on equalities which are implied by one model and, uh, and not by the other models. So, uh, substantially, you, you look at what are the implied equalities from every model. So, you, in, you use the information provided as a heuristic, you use the information provided by your theory solver. So theory solver also gives you values to the variables, okay? And if some variables are assigned to be the same value, then you branch on the qualities which are entailed by those, uh, uh, by those values, okay? And this seems uh, uh, more, uh, this uh, turns out to be a, a much more efficient strategy. Also, you instruct uh, the theory solvers to try, always try as long as possible to find, to assign different values to variables, okay? So this is an improvement of the technique which works very well, and uh, this uh, much improves further the, the technique. Okay, I think uh, we are done uh, for today. Uh, do we have any question about this? No? Okay, so take a look and uh, tomorrow will be the last class in which, uh, so this concludes uh, the part of solving, okay? Tomorrow we look at uh, uh, other capabilities, how to generate proofs in a subcourse, uh, interpolants, uh, 
we just say something about all SMT and predicted abstraction, and we hint something about uh, SMT with cost optimizations. Okay. And, uh, so tomorrow, remember 1 p.m. Okay. Then uh, uh, after this course, so when the course is closed, so the meaning uh, when uh, on Monday the course will, will be closed, uh, I wish uh, to, um, I will uh, set a doodle. Well, you know what a doodle is, right? Okay. In order to see uh, a possible day for uh, the uh, the test. Okay, so the test will be a script test, so it will be offline. So come on, guys, you are PhD students, or mostly, okay, well, or MS students, okay. So you don't do that. So I believe that uh, you are mature enough uh, to do things uh, for your own good and not for the credits uh, on or things like that. Oh, sorry. Just uh, let me let me stop here one second. Let's stop. Uh, the recording and then we discuss something about the exam. Um.